Hello and welcome to this policy exchange webinar on the other global crisis, what next for climate change and environmental policy. I'm Juliette Samuel, a senior fellow at Policy Exchange and a columnist at The Telegraph. This marks the launch of Policy Exchange's Environment and Energy Units. And today we want to make sure that we're discussing ongoing challenges uh, in an effort to make sure that humanity's other epic challenges don't get lost in the emergency we find ourselves in today. And to discuss how the coronavirus crisis can be harnessed to make things better when we emerge from it. So here to discuss those topics with me are Malcolm Turnbull and Mark Carney. They probably need no introduction to some of you, but for the others. Uh, Malcolm Turnbull was Prime Minister of Australia from 2015 to 2018, was leader of the Liberal Party there. He also has a new book out called A Bigger Picture. And he's here furthering our Australian connection because listening today is also Alexander Downer, the former Foreign Minister of Australia, who is Chairman of the Wireless Exchange Board of Trustees. Uh, along with Malcolm is Mark Carney, the former governor of the Bank of England, um, and he, uh, he's just left his role on Threadneedle Street to take up a role as a special envoy for the UN on climate change. In fact, he's left so recently that he's still in PERDA, which is the legal period in which he's not allowed to comment on certain matters directly relating to his former job that we might like to ask him about. So uh, we'll be understanding if he can't do that. And we're especially lucky to have him here to uh, talk about mm. climate change and other issues. So uh, without further ado, uh, let's get started. Uh, please, during uh, the introductory remarks, if you want to ask a question, you can click on the raise your hand button and uh, we'll endeavor to fit in as many as we can once we get to the Q&A period uh, after some introductory remarks and some questions from me. So uh, I'd like to go first to Malcolm Turnbull. Well, thank you very much, Juliet. And it's, uh, I want to thank the Policy Exchange and its distinguished chairman, Alexander Downer, my old friend and colleague, uh, for hosting us here tonight. Um, you could see the COVID uh, virus crisis pandemic as in some ways a metaphor at at high speed for the climate change challenge uh, it's only a few weeks ago perhaps perhaps six weeks ago that there were political leaders and distinguished news outlets uh, both on your side of the Atlantic and the other side uh, saying that the virus wasn't a big deal, that it was just, uh, you know, just another flu. Uh, it wasn't something to be concerned about. And some governments uh, taking that rather insouciant approach were very slow to respond. Those governments who took the scientific and medical advice most seriously and most to heart and moved most quickly uh, have had the best or perhaps least bad experience or their people have had the least bad experience of it. So in some respects, now that I think we all know what we're grappling with, the COVID virus has been a case of biology confronting, uh, confronting and, uh, and uh, really shaking the complacency of day-to-day -day politics with a physical reality of sickness, and death on a scale we haven't seen uh, for a very long time. And so the question really is, why do so many people in government and so many people in politics, particularly in the Anglosphere, not take the scientific evidence on climate change just as seriously? When is physics going to mug political complacency and denialism? What will it, when will that happen? just as biology has mugged uh, the complacency of politics with respect to the virus. Now, the, the reality is that while we have wasted a huge amount of time uh, in not getting things done to reduce global greenhouse gas emissions, we are in a better position to do so than we've ever been before. Uh, technology has come to our aid, uh, you know, the cost per watt, of energy from electricity, from uh, photovoltaics has declined by 90% over the last decade, actually a little bit more. 
the decline in wind uh, generated energy has declined by not quite so much, but also dramatically. The cost of storage has declined. We are now in a position, certainly in my country, Australia, where the where new generation is cheapest if it the, the cheapest new generation comes from uh, variable renewables which are zero cost marginal generators of course which is the most significant uh, you know aspect of them feature of them uh, and storage right and so we are now in a position where we can have our cake and eat it too where we can have lower greenhouse gas emissions dramatically lower and cheaper electricity and all that is needed is engineering and economics to replace ideology and idiocy. Uh, we have got the opportunity. We are going to need to spend. Governments are going to need to spend a lot of money to uh, get their economy started again. Uh, the challenge from uh, climate change is just as existential, in fact, arguably more so than it is from the virus. And so the opportunity now is to get on with it. There really are no excuses any longer. Uh, it is not, we, we have the means to do it. Uh, all that we are lacking is the political will and all we have to overcome is the denialism, which in America and in Australia and to a lesser extent in the UK has turned the physics of global warming into an issue of values, identity or belief. That's, the, that's what we have to get over uh, and we've got the means to do it. Thank you very much, Malcolm, uh, for those remarks. And now we'll go straight to Mark Carney. Great. Um, thank you very much, Juliet. Um, thank you, Dean and Policy Exchange and uh, Andrew Downer for hosting this. Uh, good luck on the launch of the new initiative. It's hugely important. And let me say at the outset, it's a tremendous honor for me to uh, be on this panel with uh, Malcolm Turnbull, um, who brings a unique uh, combination of business acumen and experience um, and true political courage on a wide range of issues, but perhaps none more so than on climate change and, uh, and uh, both domestically in Australia and internationally. Um, let me just echo a couple of things. And I, what, what I want to principally concentrate on is the policy response and put a few ideas on the table uh, of how we emerge from this. Um, but the first, just to reinforce, um, what do we take from our current uh, predicament? Uh, that Malcolm touched on, uh, which is you can't wish away systemic risks. Uh, in the end, uh, they, uh, a small investment up front uh, can save uh, uh, tremendous costs down the road. Um, and we have a situation with climate change, uh, which will involve the entire world and from which we can't self-isolate, um, and uh, is predicted not just to be a risk tomorrow, but the central uh, scenario uh, tomorrow. Um, so the question I think was put on the table is what's next for policy and the, the climate policy in the context of um, the COVID crisis. And uh, I think just to put that in uh, perspective, in terms of the immediate policy response on COVID, there's really three phases. Um, there's the um, immediate response where the focus has been to um, preserve productive capacity as much as possible, keep as many people as possible uh, connected to work maintain incomes um, and that is requiring something on the order of 10 to 15 percentage points of GDP in most uh, economies. Um, as we move into the next phase uh, with some uh, reopening of our economies, uh, one would expect an initial uh, you know, sort of classic pump priming uh, support for the economy. But really the question here is around the reset or the rebuild or the relaunch uh, of the economy and that's what I want to uh, focus on. Um, First, I think for gov any government, whether it's here, Australia, Canada, um, uh, wherever, um, has to look at the economic context of what we're coming out. And in this regard, we're all Leninists now, uh, Leninists in the sense of decades happening in weeks, understanding what that truly means. And there has been an acceleration of some trends in the economy, many of which are positive, um, some of which we're experiencing right now in terms of more effective ways of working. Um, some of which will be challenges. I uh, would expect that you know, supply chains are going to move from global and just in time to more local and certainly much more resilient. Um, consumer attitudes changing. Um, you know, we've had large swaths of our population that are either unemployed or having brushes with unemployment, a sense of what it is to be unemployed. And that changes people's narratives. And so uh, industries that are levered to um, uh, household debt and uh, consumption will, uh, will face changes. And then 
The last point on the economic side, which I think is hugely important for framing uh, the policy response is, look, the larger uh, heavy emitter industries, most of them are under extreme pressure and most of them will face some form of restructuring. So we're coming out of this, um, and as we re truly come out of this, there will be quite a massive reallocation of capital uh, that's going to be required. And the question is, how is that capital going to be channeled? And what can policy do um, to help it be channeled in the right direction so we've got a truly competitive and sustainable economy? Um, so the role for public policy, um, I'll suggest, is threefold. Uh, and just so I can remember them, I'll start them all with F, um, fiscal framing and finance. On the fiscal side, a lot of attention on um, infrastructure spend and green infrastructure. I, I just put in context, post global financial crisis, only one in six uh, dollars, pounds, um, euros was spent on sustainable inf infrastructure. Uh, the focus was on shovel ready. I'm not sure we should be shovel ready and backwards looking. Uh, coming out of this, given some of the bigger trends, and Malcolm just alluded to some of them. Secondly, around outcome-oriented fiscal policy. So in other words, uh, accelerating the transition to uh, cleaner energy and thinking about those next generation technologies, whether it's hydrogen and storage, as Malcolm mentioned, carbon capture uh, and use. Um, but probably because of fiscal constraints, what's going to be as important is the second two wraps, um, framing, uh, by which I mean regulatory uh, policy. Um, so think um, those uh, commitments, um, such as um, uh, the phasing out of uh, internal combustion engines is a step that the UK has taken, but uh, by 2035, uh, France 2040, other countries I think will consider and look to that. Um, mandates for fuel use um, in transportation sectors, so blends of hydrogen into, let's say, maritime and or aviation. Uh, commercial building and other codes, uh, those, those types of policies are almost micro-framing policies. Um, but then also on the macro side, um, the fact is the state is going to be, and most of our economies have very large exposure uh, to the economy through various support mechanisms, lending mechanisms. And the question is, what's the ask related to that if those uh, supports are extended? And I think if you're in the United Kingdom, if you're in Europe, if you're in one of the 120 other countries uh, that have net zero targets, it is a reasonable request of companies, uh, certainly larger companies, to have a transition plan, a plan that they come up with, not dictating them the plan, but a plan that they have um, for managing uh, their transition towards net zero. Uh, because after all, if we're relaunching our economy, if we're restructuring a number of industries, and that's not the state doing it, it's the actual economics doing it. Uh, it's reasonable to expect that uh, companies are relaunching uh, for, for these, uh, these core objectives. And then the last point I just wanna make and I'll hand back is just around the financial side. Um, the, uh, as part of COP26, uh, which obviously, as you know, the UK is hosting uh, next year, um, what we wanna do on the private financial side is to put in place framework policies so that in effect, every professional financial decision takes climate into account. Takes it into account just like um, professionals take into account interest rate risk or credit risk or other uh, financial factors. They need a few simple things in order to do that. First is information. We need a reporting standard that is global, comprehensive, uh, consistent. The private sector has already come up with a gold standard for this. It's called the TCFD. And we want to just walk that towards being mandatory. Um, secondly, what we need is the equivalent for the financial sector of what I just said on the transition side. Um, it is reasonable to expect that um, not just companies, the users of capital, but also the suppliers of capital, whether they're banks, uh, insurance companies, investors, investment managers, um, ultimately will have and will reveal where they are on that transition towards net zero. So what we need to develop is from a private sector perspective is what are the standards in order to report that. Um, so with that uh, opening, why don't I hand it back to you, Juliet, and uh, we'll be guided. Thanks. Okay, great. So I'm going to ask uh, a series of questions. We're going to have a bit of a conversation and then we will throw it open to the audience and expand the conversation to you guys. So the first uh, obvious question, I suppose, to bring the topic together with the current situation is to ask, has the coronavirus made this task easier or harder? 
easier perhaps because it aids some creative destruction, uh, but harder because perhaps most populations will just want growth at any cost as soon as the, the lockdowns are over and they won't care if it's green growth or not. So uh, well, maybe let, Malcolm, let, you, you let, can... Let, yeah, let, let me have a go at that. Um, I understand that uh, demand for electric vehicles has actually strengthened uh, in several markets. Um, this is uh, an indi indication, perhaps, that people are very alert to the, you know, to the confrontation, I suppose, that we're having with Mother Nature, uh, with biology in this case. Um, Tom Friedman touches on this on a good piece in the New York Times yesterday. Uh, you know, we, we can't blather our way past the reality of the virus. We can't blather our way past the reality of global warming. So I think, so maybe that will help it. In terms of growth, I, I think the, the big fallacy that we have got to get over is out of date thinking on the economics of energy generation. I mean, the, the, the truth is, the facts are that the cheapest form of new generation today is uh, renewables, you know, especially photovoltaics and storage, you know, the, and the cost of these per watt are coming down all the time. You know, there, I mean, there is a, you know, there is a, a new technology, I won't, I can, as Alex down and knows, I, if, if tempted, I can bore for the world on some of these things, so I'll restrain myself. But, the, you know, there are the new technologies with the, uh, the photovoltaic units, which will increase the energy efficiency of a solar panel by 50%. Right? Uh, this is, so there's a lot more to go. And so really, uh, so much of the, you know, defence of the fossil fuel sector is coming now from vested interests, which I suppose you can understand in an economic sense, and a sort of uh, political populism that, as I was saying earlier, has turned what should be a question of fact into an issue of belief. I mean, if you, if you want to have lower emissions and cheaper electricity, and I would say both are conducive to stronger economic growth, then now is the time for a concerted investment in the engineering and the economics uh, that, you know, a, a renewable, a zero emission energy sector requires. And that's, you know, that requires a lot of planning, uh, but it is very, very doable. So this is a, this is a great opportunity to strike a blow for, uh, against global warming and to provide the economic stimulus of uh, reliable and cheaper electricity. Mark? Yeah, I, I just pick up on that, very much agree with it. Um, I think it's, you know, the basic question is not where the economy was, but where is the economy going? Um, you, and you see a variety of these trends. And I'll, I'll just give, make a couple of points. One is, if you look at, and you can debate, you know, um, uh, you know, small percentage points, but the market cap of Tesla is bigger than the sum of the market caps of Ford, GM, Fiat, Daimler, and BMW combined, Okay. So that tells you something about the direction or should tell us something about the direction of where um, the market thinks um, value is going to be created in, uh, in transport. Uh, when we look at the scale of um, energy infrastructure requirements globally, uh, they're on the order of, normally they run about one and a half uh, to one, you know, $1.7 trillion uh, a year of energy investment. Uh, it scales up to on the order of $3 trillion. Um, once, uh, once sustainable infrastructure is taken into account. Huge economic opportunity. I mean, these, are, these are pure economic opportunities. And there has been this shift uh, that Malcolm alludes to on uh, the electricity side, uh, which brings associated opportunities, many of which in this country, in the UK, um, there's, real, uh, there's real comparative and competitive advantage, which, uh, which brings jobs. And it's, you know, in the end, the question, the challenge is going to be, um, where are we going, not where were we? Um, you've got to restructure a bunch of industries. Um, don't try to go back to status quo ante, um, but try to leapfrog ahead. And this is, um, you know, it's a terrible situation we're, we're going through, uh, but there is a big opportunity at the end of it. 
So both of you frame this as essentially a kind of upfront capital problem whereby if only we could get to this great world where we had cheaper, cleaner energy, um, you know, the cost would be lower and it would pay for itself, but we need to spend the money to get there. So I wonder, well, is, is that right? First of all, that that's how you see it. And if it is, um, we're going to be coming out of this with uh, governments in a lot more debt and companies having run down a lot of their cash. So how, how are we going to then front up the, the cash needed to get us to, into this world of better, cheaper energy? Okay, I, I have to say, I don't think you need a lot of governments. I don't think you need you know, big government subsidies here. I mean, it's, it's really uh, ensuring you've got the right regulatory framework. It may be, that you, you know, you've, you've got to make sure that government assists and promotes what is going to be an inevitable market. Uh, development. Uh, it may be that government encourages the retirement of coal-fired power stations a bit earlier. So you might have a plant that, you know, has got notionally 20 years of life left in it. You might say, well, let's, you know, let, let's wrap this old clunker up a bit sooner. Uh, but, you know, the basically zero marginal cost generation, particularly wind, wind and solar preeminently, is smashing the economics of the coal-fired power stations. This is one of the reasons why Britain, you know, doesn't burn a lot of coal anymore, because if you've got a plant that you need to operate 24 hours a day, uh, and, and you've, you're fine, Look, to, I'm just shifting back to Australia now, where you've got a very big solar resource, and you've got a huge supply of solar energy in the, you know, during the daylight hours, suddenly energy costs go you know, to very low levels and the coal-fired generator is still costing, his marginal cost remains the same. So, it, you know, I mean, renewables are smashing the economics of the uh, fossil fuel generators, particularly the ones that have to keep generating all the time, like coal. Uh, and, and so, you know, ultimately, I think the role of fossil fuels in electricity uh, should be no more than uh, as you know gas peaking plants used as backup generators uh, and of course they have the advantage of them on and off relatively quickly but it is it, look th th this this transition is coming and what we can do govern what governments can do with some astute planning and some uh, judicious uh, incentives and a little bit of investment uh, what they can do is get is, is accelerate it, and the outcome will be both you know good for the planet from a global warming point of view, but also will un, will result in uh, cheaper electricity. I mean, Alex Downer uh, is a is a South Australian, and South Australia is a good case. As, as this is a state which which went very long on wind. Long background to that, but they didn't uh, take into account the need to back it up. That, but that was the mistake they made bluntly. So there was, you know, good intentions, but poor planning. And they ended up at one point with the most expensive and least reliable electricity in Australia. They're now well on the way to having the cheapest electricity in Australia, because what they've done is worked out that you've got to have the backup, whether it's a bit of gas firming, whether it's some batteries, whether it's pumped hydro. And so, you know, the reality is it's right there. You know, you can actually see it, you can touch it. Uh, this uh, reality of cheaper electricity with all of the benefits that brings and uh, zero emissions. You know, we, the, the, uh, you know, renewables plus storage are the better mousetrap. You know, that is, that, that is where we've got to move and the barriers are political and, uh, and you know, vested interests who are, you know, trying to preserve their, you know, their monopoly. They were not their monopoly, their, you know, their rent seeking that they've had from their position of, their commanding heights uh, of dominating the energy sector. Yeah. So let me, uh, Juliet, if I may, um, you know, what I was trying to emphasize in my remarks, maybe it wasn't clear enough, was I actually think the second two Fs are more important than the first. So less on the fiscal, uh, because there will be fiscal constraints. Um, so less on the government spend. Um, yes, uh, that which is spent should be spent wisely, and uh, in my view, should have this orientation. Um, but more about the, what I was saying, the framing and the finance. So in other words, 
where is the economy going? How do you use regulation and, and, uh, and disclosure and just let the market determine uh, where the future is? Um, and let me, let me try to make a tangible bit, um, which is around the airline industry. So obviously the airline industry is under tremendous pressure. Uh, we have daily headlines about various support or bailout packages around the world. I'm not talking uniquely about the UK. So it's under tremendous pressure. There's going to be big adjustments to capacity, big adjustments to routes because of nature of travel. Um, and the question is also, what is going to happen? For example, there's an initiative called the Clean Skies Initiative, which British Airways and others uh, are a part of, which is kind of meeting on where the industry is going in terms of getting emissions down. Now, it's going, if, if there's going to be substantial support and a restructuring of an industry, myself, including as myself as a private creditor or investor, I'm going to want to know what their plan is, the individual airline or sector is for one of the biggest um, uh, drivers of value uh, and risk going forward. So this uh, crisis accelerates those types of changes. And the question is, is government playing a role? Is policy playing a role around that? Let me make one final point, which is that, and uh, Malcolm, I read your book, um, uh, recommend it. I'll take a chance to recommend it. Good, thank you. There's a variety of things in there. Uh, but one of them is around uh, on climate policy. There's a number of interesting things with climate policy. And I think one of the things you stress and you live is the importance of predictability on climate policy and how you see the reaction of the private sector once there's an expectation that governments are headed in a certain direction and then that pulls forward adjustment. Mm -hmm. So this is a reset. You know, we're going to go through a reset. We can take choices as, as various countries on various governments. But if you start s setting out the path for policy, um, whether it's in the airline sector, whether it's in energy renewables and others, um, the private sector is going to respond. It's not a big government spend. And quite frankly, in a very constrained environment, that's exactly what we need from a macro perspective in order, uh, in order to grow more strongly out of this. So in terms of the, the cost and uh, I mean, part of this cost is going to fall on, on companies, which uh, will be, a lot of them quite short of cash after the crisis, but some parts of it will have to happen through government in terms of just infrastructure that has to be built, right? In terms of upgrades to the grid or battery charging stations, things like that. And in the UK, there has been a, a you know, hugely ambitious targets put into law, but a lot of uh, doubt or questions over well, how are we actually going to get there? How's this stuff going to be built? You know, you can pass a target, but, but how are you going to get there? So I wonder what you uh, both make of, of that part of the challenge and in terms of also providing predictability to industry. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I just say, I think one of the advantages you have in the UK over Australia and the United States is that climate change is not the same political you know, blood-soaked political battlefield it is in Australia or the US. Um, obviously, there are differences between the parties and issues of extent and degree and so forth. But um, it has been a it's been a terrible, uh, you know, uh, war climate wars. We talk about it in Australia over a very long time now. Um, there was a happy time in two thousand and seven when both John Howard, who's the Prime Minister, and I was his Environment Minister, uh, was advocating an emissions trading scheme, and so was Kevin Rudd. So there was a sort of a bipartisan moment, but sadly, it was all too fleeting. Um, but, but you know, predictability is the key. I mean, business, business, are, business are kind of, uh, they're not completely indifferent as to what the rules are, but they just want to know what they are. You know, you've got to, you've got to have a degree of stability and certainty i mean obviously there's nothing certain in life except death and taxes but 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 at least governments need to define what what it is they want to do and how they're going to get there now you know we had a a point as as um as you know mark will have read and he would have known anyway i've related in my book we got to the point in my government of a, a policy that had just overwhelming support and uh, yet the right wing of my party um and uh, aided and you know, amplified by the Murdoch media in particular, quite deliberately blew it up. And so we now have the unhappy situation of having 
higher energy prices and higher emissions than we otherwise would. So, you know, it's a, it is, it is in, this, in our country, the, bar, the, the ba barrier to effective action on climate change has been almost entirely political. And it's this sort of toxic combination of right-wing populism, this anti-science agenda, which is a you know very very dangerous, very slippery slope, dangerous slippery slope, coupled with uh, you know uh, their friends in the uh, in the media, and of course the vested interests, who are the easiest ones, as I said earlier, to understand. Mark, did you want to say anything? Uh, well, I mean, a lot, lot of life is about execution obviously. Um, but uh, I think in the UK, so I'm not sure about the specifics of the charging station execution. I'm not, you know, my, my responsibilities don't quite extend down to that level of uh, granularity. Obviously, it's important, but the overall orientation of this country uh, is pretty clear, as Malcolm just said, and you would know, and we live, is that there is, there has been a political consensus about the objective. Net zero 2050 is the law of the land here. It's had legal implications um, already with Heathrow. Um, and there is, and I'm repeating myself, but it's important that there is a big reset that's occasioned by this crisis. And to the extent to which new policies are put in place that um, affect the speed with which we move um, towards that objective, which is the law, um, uh, that has to be, you know, it has to be taken into consideration. And that the more uh, consistent those policies are, it all doesn't have to be solved up front. But the more consistent those policies are, the more the private sector is going to anticipate their direction, the more they're going to pull forward an adjustment um, and with that investment, uh, which is going to help growth and is going to help UK uh, competitiveness. So uh, in many respects, the, the foundations are here and they're in pretty good shape. Let me, let me make another point, which is that, um, you know, obviously the city of London is, uh, is the world's leading international financial center by far. Um, and the vast majority of capital in the city of London um, is looking for the type of information to make these investment decisions, right? There is $130 trillion of balance sheet behind TCFD disclosure. Um, and in the teeth, I'll give you one, idiosyncratic example, but I think it illustrates a broader point. In the middle of at the height, uh, and let's hope it was the height of the COVID crisis at the end of March, um, Barclays uh, came out and uh, committed as Barclays um, to get to net zero by 2050 on what's called scope three emissions. And scope three emissions means it's not just their operations or the power they use, but the emissions of uh, the companies uh, to whom they lend or in which they invest. Um, and so that gives a sense of the orientation of the private sector. I mean, I, the questions keep pulling it back into the public sector. I think quite a big component of what's going on is being missed and the importance of signals and direction are, are, are you know, potentially underplayed. And that would be a mistake. That would be, a, 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 in my view, a big mistake from a policy perspective is to put this all into a camp of government spend as opposed to public framing of where the uh, of where the economy is going, so the private sector can get on with it. So, so some of the expectations that you're talking about there in industry are expectations of a a cost or that that may be imposed on the current way of doing things, and therefore a relative um, benefit to changing the way things are done. From from what I understand, from what from what you were saying, so I wonder what it is you think that industry needs or is expecting in government policy that is going to change that cost-benefit analysis? Well, I think the, uh, at the risk of repeating, I mean, what, what industry expects is predictability. Um, it's, um, it, uh, you know, again, in- I, 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 in, I suppose I mean things like, you know, is it a carbon tax or is it a, you know, a- I think it's, I think it's less that. Um, I mean, it depends on jurisdiction. Um, it's less that. It's um, uh, in some countries, and I'll speak globally, some, it, would, it would be less, you know, fewer subsidies to um, uh, fossil fuel heavy 
uh, initiatives. It, it, it is things like, um, so for example, the phase out of IC um, in internal combustion engines in the UK, 2030, the 2035 rather, um, that is a big signal. That is a big directional signal um, for, um, uh, for the auto industry um, and uh, for the component suppliers. Um, for the um, for even for our AI sector because it's relevant to autonomous vehicles which tend to be um, uh, electric uh, vehicles and it shows it, it is a pointer towards arguably where most of the advanced world is going is going to go UK may get there first uh, it's a pointer to what types of investment opportunities I have in that post ICE private transport world um, and then there's a judgment about how quickly, uh, you know, will government stay the course on that? Uh, I would, well, uh, you, you can make your own judgment about it. Different people have different opinions, um, but investment flows uh, that follows from that. J Juliet, if I could just add, add to that. I mean, look, the, the key thing here, that, that there, there are a lot of things that business will do and can do. Uh, there are a lot of things that can be done in the built environment. Uh, but the single biggest uh, levers are firstly to move to a zero emission electricity sector coupled with the electrification of the economy. So if you have all of your electricity is coming from zero emission sources and you have vehicles, you know, being uh, powered by electricity and a lot of the uh, applications we use uh, fossil fuels for heating, for example, we move that that moves to electricity, and that will all be driven by much cheaper electricity. Uh, then, uh, you know, you I'm not, you know, there's lots of other issues, you know, lots of other issues to address. <clears throat> but you know, you, you you are you're dealing with a very big chunk of the problem there. So um, that's the and and you know, I can say in in Australia certainly. All the energy sector needs is some predictable rules, and that is where we will go. It's the, it is the, it is the perception of flakiness and unpredictability from government that is uh, the biggest risk at the moment. I mean, there was one. I mean, to give you an idea of the absurdity of it, and this is what happens when you turn uh, a, phys a physical fact like global warming into a political football. Uh, one large investor in renewables, one of the you know very largest funds, um, was saying to me uh, not so long ago that they regarded Australia as being too high in political risk to invest in renewables, and they preferred to invest in China, where they thought policy was more predictable. Now that's a that's you know that's a that's a terrible commentary. So I I think that um, both of you are talking. Uh, a bit about the net cost of this that when we when we get to cheaper electricity we won't have to bear greater costs but with any change there are winners and losers along the way and there are industries that won't be viable so how can government what, what industries are you thinking of what industries yeah. do you think would not be viable i'm not sure what they well, are well i mean if you take the us for example those coal mines that donald trump said he was going to reopen you know, so what perfect. proportion, Juliet? What 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 are the what's the employment in those coal mines versus the employment in the renewable sector in the U.S.? Well, I, I, you would have to I have to go and look that up. But it but this is your keeping on these banana skins, right? Where, whether it's Macron in France imposing a tax on the gilets jaunes, or you know Donald Trump being elected by by post-industrial towns in the U.S., the question is how do you politically get through? It, you can tell people, well, this is all going to be so much cheaper. But if they believe their job or their taxes at the pump are going to go up, mm. then they won't vote for it. No, that's that's true. And so you've got to be able to deliver. Um, I think with, I mean, what has smashed coal mining in the United States is not uh, solar panels. It is four dollars a gigajoule gas, and and cheaper, in fact. So so what? So it was technology technology that that hit the coal sector in the U.S. And it wasn't photovoltaics. It was horizontal drilling and fracking. Uh, that uh, accessed all of those, um, you know, unconventional gas and oil reserves, and that's you know that's what's basic. That that has been the big driver 
uh, in the US. So, you know, the, the coal, I mean, thermal coal is on the way out. I mean, we shouldn't kid ourselves about this. Not only is it on the way out from an economic point of view, but it should be on the way out. And uh, that's the, you know, that is, uh, that's, that's the reality. And unless you're going to get into the loopiness and who knows what could happen in uh, some countries, unless you're going to get into the loopiness of actually subsidising thermal coal as against uh, cleaner and cheaper forms of, ge of energy generation, it is, you know, its, it's day is uh, coming to an end just simply on economic grounds. I mean, you would not build, like in, in Australia, we've got a lot of coal and it still, you know, produces much of our electricity. Uh, you would not, nobody would build a new coal-fired power station here. The economics of it, regardless of what the carbon position was, the economics of it do not stack up. That's just, you know, that's, that, that, is, that is a fact and not, and not a controversial one. So... So, you know, the question is, how do we get, we know where we're going. The question is, is how do we get there? And if we keep on throwing up obstacles, political obstacles, as has been the case in many places, uh, then you run the risk that you end up with the worst of both worlds, higher emissions and higher energy prices. Okay. Um, uh, we're now going to go to some questions from the audience. Unless, Mark, you wanted to say anything. No, it doesn't look like it. Okay. So... We are going to throw it open to you guys, and uh, I would just ask you to please say your full name and your organization uh, once your microphone goes on. So we're going to go first to Victoria. Hi there, it's Victoria Gill. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Yep. Hi, um, so I'm science and environment correspondent from BBC News. Thanks very much um, for the opportunity to ask the question. Um, I wanted to ask two things. Um, they're, they're linked, so maybe it's most efficient if I just ask them both together. Um, first of all, how in a world where every country is just trying to recover from the enormous costs of this pandemic, uh, is it going to be possible to reach the 2020 target of $100 billion of aid for the poorest nations that do have to put in mitigations for climate change right now and don't have the money to do so. And zooming in on the UK, how would you advise uh, this country to, to invest in its own net zero targets um, when it will also be a priority to get people back to work? That phrase, back to work, um, it sounds like going back to business as usual. So how, where does the incentive and where does the money come from um, to invest in, in both of those things? Well, perhaps if I could answer the second part and the banker can answer, Mark can answer the first part. Uh, the second part is that, uh, you know, a, 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 an investment, investment in uh, renewables and additional, you know, enhanced uh, grid infrastructure to enable a more distributed, uh, you know, more distributed sources of generation. All of that uh, is uh, job creating. So, you know, you, there's a... I, I'm not one. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm not. A, I'm not a Leninist, despite uh, Marx's invitation earlier. And uh, while I'm, a, while I'm, I think we're all definitely may not all be Leninists. We're definitely Keynesians now. But, but, and I, I don't believe that we, you know, pay a thousand people to dig a thousand holes and another thousand to fill them in. But nonetheless, this is a time when governments can say, let's bring forward investment in infrastructure that maybe, you know, in a pre-COVID world, we were, got, were planning to do in five years' time or 10 years' time. You know, this is a time when you can bring forward good projects. And the, if, you, if you do have this net zero target, which you do in the UK, then bringing forward the investment to, you know, try and achieve it five years earlier, perhaps, uh, or 10 years earlier, uh, that's, uh, you know, that's going to be money very well spent, in my view. Yeah, um, yeah, just to be clear, my Leninism only extended to uh, the speed of acceleration of, uh, of uh, some of the changes in the economy. And my point um, was that as, we d as governments design and put in place whatever uh, stimulus programs they put in place, um, they need to think about where the economy is going, what have we learned from the recent experience, and what changes that are coming um, uh, can be brought forward. Um, and uh, as Malcolm just said, some of the infrastructure spend that perhaps would have come down the road 
um, that be consistent with a more sustainable uh, uh, and competitive, and I'd underscore competitive, medium term competitive, uh, energy system could be brought forward and or some of the regulations, which again, regulation, which itself is not a cost to the FISC, not a cost to the government. It is a direction for the economy and private investment. On your first question on the, uh, on the 100 billion, um, as, as you know, the, the accounting on that is uh, coming into this is, uh, it's in the low 70s, uh, so it's around 70, 72 billion or so uh, are the flows. I think there is a question, I mean, these are questions for governments, um, and I, I stress the S in government. Uh, it's a priority for the COP um, uh, that the UK is sharing in partnership with Italy to get that up to uh, the number, to the commitment that was made in, uh, in Paris. Um, and it will be important that um, through the various channels, including through the multilateral development banks, um, the development finance um, uh, institutes, uh, institutions, um, that uh, that uh, additional uh, support um, helps to close that gap or closes that gap. Um, and I think we should, just in taking a step back, if I may, just from a macro perspective, uh, one of the things that's happening in the global economy is that um, we have our challenges uh, here, uh, but there are pretty big challenges in the emerging and developing world um, that um, are going to uh, cause challenges for them honestly at home but it will multiply the demand stock to places like the uk uh, so it is in our interest to um uh, to help to smooth the, uh, their transitions as well okay we're now going to go to kishra if you could again say your full name and affiliation hi i'm uh, baroness faulkner of margravine a uh, member of the house of lords uh, and my principal question really is to Governor Carney, but before I say that, can I just thank both our speakers for how lucidly they've given us a roadmap, a very plausible roadmap of what we need to do to get to net zero. And it's, I'm hugely grateful to Policy Exchange for giving us this opportunity to hear, to, to hear their thoughts today. Um, Mark, uh, good to engage with you again. Uh, no. I've been slightly concerned to see that the, in the Brexit negotiations, we're getting to another pinch point, which is over the environment, which is one where the UK set out several years ago in legislation, its benchmark and goals of where it needed to, do, to be to get to net zero. And now the EU, it appears, is wanting to enshrine that into a Brexit treaty. Um, do you think that we can trust countries like this to do what they say they'll do? Or do we really need to enshrine, enshrine climate, climate targets into international law? Um, okay, if I, it's, a, it's a great question. <laughs> um, it's not an entirely welcome question, but it's a great question. Uh, and it's a relevant question. And I'm, I'm going to try to, if, can I answer it? I'm going to answer it at the end um, uh, yeah, as a general point, um, and let me say two things in that regard. So in terms of the role of climate in trade uh, and trade agreements, um, as you know, uh, Malcolm knows well, everyone knows, the, you know, the, the genius of the Paris Agreement or the breakthrough of the Paris Agreement was that countries or jurisdictions decided by themselves what their level of ambition was going to be. And then they had these nationally determined contributions. So these climate plans and these objectives, it wasn't, as you know, a treaty they weren't bound by, it wasn't like Kyoto, they weren't bound by that. Um, and the intention with COP is to keep, COP26 is to keep that architecture, um, up the ambition, everybody comes back and has their new uh, climate plans. But again, it's not an enshrined treaty responsibility. Um, and that, um, the judgment with which I would, would agree is that that is the most effective way to bring 195, hopefully 195 plus countries uh, along. Um, and it also addresses, um, it helps address the democratic accountability issues, which are so crucial. A lot of this discussion has been about politics. Um, so that's the first point. And, and that I could stop there and answer it that way. Uh, the one thing that is was developing prior to the COVID crisis 
was the early stage of uh, an expectation in some jurisdictions that they would be potentially moving faster and materially faster than others. And as a consequence of that, that there would be risk that uh, they would get so far ahead in terms of the adjustment that there would be outsourcing or uh, of, um, of, uh, there'd be carbon dumping um, up the supply chain. Now, to be honest, the extent to which companies are disclosing um, and have transition plans on scope three emissions, that, that is not an issue because you, you know, that, that's brought into the actual disclosure. So there's a, there's a more market-based way to deal with this than the alternative, which the logic I just started to outline leads some to, is that you have border adjustment taxes or you bring this into, you bring this into trade agreements. Um, I think that would be best, it's best avoided. Uh, it's a global problem that is, uh, uh, you know, we should, we should fight hard to keep the uh, approach developed at Paris and that's the intention of the UK, uh, the UK presidency um, uh, on a very high level of ambition. And I do think that private finance can play a complementary role because what we are seeing, whether it's Microsoft, BP, Barclays, I mentioned earlier, others, uh, that they're coming out with net zero targets themselves. And in most cases, those are scope three, which means that it, it, it's their global footprint that matters and that that's what gets disclosed and that's what they're measured against. Um, and that helps solve uh, these, uh, these, trade, uh, these, uh, these, these trade issues, I would like to think. Uh, Malcolm, do you want to say anything? Or no, no, I think that's, that's fine. Okay, that's good. we will. Uh, uh, yeah, next well, question sorry. is from Stephen. Thank you. Um, Stephen Lynch from Channel 4. Um, I wondered if I could ask about something quite specific. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, sovereign wealth funds. Um, so I guess to, uh, to Mr. Turnbull, I'd ask um, what role did Australia's um, sovereign wealth fund play in helping the country um, deal with climate change generally? And a similar question to Dr. Carney, um, what role would a sovereign wealth fund, if it was set up here in the UK, what role do you think that could play um, in this area? Well, look, I, I, I'm uh, the, the our sovereign wealth fund, you know, which is called the Future Fund that Peter Costello chairs. Uh, its focus has been clearly on delivering a particular return, uh, so it doesn't. It's not a policy-driven investor. Uh, so, and I and I don't, uh, you know, I don't see any uh, need for it, frankly, to be so. Um, you know, if government wants to. Uh, play a role in um, in the energy sector, and and it can it does and it can do. A lot of energy infrastructure belongs to government. Uh, then it can do so directly. I mean, for example, one of the initiatives of my government was the uh, was the Snowy Hydro 2.0 uh, pumped hydro project, which will be the biggest um, pumped hydro project in the southern hemisphere and one of the biggest in the world. Now that is a government-owned project. Now that's not because I'm I'm uh, particularly keen on the government owning energy infrastructure, but for a whole range of reasons that the Australians would be well very familiar with. Snowy Hydro is an iconic asset that could never be privatised. It would be it'd be easier to sell the Harbour Bridge than it, or the Opera House than it would be to, to sell Snowy Hydro. And so either the government did it or it wasn't done at all. And uh, in a big, flat, dry continent, there aren't not a lot of places where you've got two huge dams that are 700 metres difference in elevation and relatively adjacent. So, so you know, I think there are roles where government can step in. I think it can clearly play a role in sort of common user infrastructure like transmission grids and, and you know, move things along there. And we've seen examples of that uh, uh, relatively recently as well. Uh, but, you know, the... Honestly, there is a, as, as Mark was saying earlier, and I agree, there is a lot of money available to invest in this transition, um, a lot. Uh, but you do need to have, you, you've got to have some predictable rules because you're talking about people making investments in infrastructure that they're looking at, you know, 25 plus year returns on. So they've got to have a degree of, uh, of predictability. <laughs> 
Yeah, I, I just I entirely agree with that. I'll just add a couple of things. So I would just to be absolutely clear, I wouldn't, and I don't know, Stephen, if that was the gist of your question, but uh, I would not set up a sovereign wealth fund to, to invest in a specific, and with direction to invest in certain types uh, of industries, whatever those industries are. Um, but I will observe the following, which is that whether it's the Future Fund, whether it's the Norwegian uh, Sovereign Wealth Fund, uh, the Caste de Pau in Quebec, uh, CPPIB, uh, the list goes on. The big asset owners, uh, the long-term asset owners, disproportionately invest along net zero lines. Um, and there's something called the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance, uh, which is an example. Of, I'll, I'll take Japan Pension Fund, 1.6 trillion. Uh, of, uh, of assets under management um, that looks actually at the degree warming potential of their portfolio. Uh, there's a number of uh, those uh, pension funds and some wealth funds that are managing that down um, because they know they're going to be around as these issues come to bear um, and they have enough of a judgment. So they're not directed by their governments or their mandates to do this, but from a longer term value creation, um, they, uh, they see that as the, uh, as the opportunity. Okay, um, I, I think we've got another question. Yeah, we've got another question coming from Sue. Hi, um, I'm Sue Morgan. I'm the Director of Architecture and Built Environment at the Design Council. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar, we were set up by Churchill in 1944 to support the government in uh, post-war recovery. Um, we work with partners in the private and public sector to help create better design places and the value of design is recognised as a powerful powerhouse for UK GDP as well as its well-being for citizens and before the pandemic we recognised clearly the need for you know climate change urgently needs to be addressed particularly in cities for health and well-being um, you know heat islands flooding etc so my question is a bit more kind of micro and granular um, but though we have funded incentives, potentially through green bonds, lending, GREBs, um, supporting the private finance sector, how can we lever in significant investment to support the public sector to ensure we address climate action, particularly through green infrastructure and the built form? I think we've all recognised um, in the COVID lockdown the absolute emphasis that green infrastructure has to play on people's health and well-being, but also the critical aspect the green infrastructure has to play in helping mitigate uh, climate change. Well, I mean, Sue, I, if my, you, you really need the other Turnbull, Lucy, uh, to answer this. She's the, the urban, urbanist in the family, but I just say I think the answer has got to be good planning. Uh, you know, uh, uh, consent authorities are entitled to uh, they do, you know, make lots of requirements in terms of uh, what's able to be built. Governments can lead by example, of course, with their own investments. Uh, but, uh, you know, building sustainability, requiring sustainability to be built into design is um, fundamental. I mean, a very good way to do that, I'll just leave with one practical example, is with design competitions. Uh, Lucy uh, was very, uh, you know, pioneered that in the city of Sydney. And, and it's, look, it's not an original idea, but you know, if you have, if you decide you want to achieve some outcomes and you the consent authority, you have a design competition and uh, you can always, very easy to provide some incentives to ensure that you get the most sustainable building built, you know, um, you, you, I mean, I'm sure you understand how that's, how that's done. So I, I think, I think you've just got to work out what you want to achieve and get, and get on with it. I mean, it's, uh, it is, you know, we, um, well, we, you know, in Australia, in Australia, we, you know, we, we are just, we, it's, it's in relatively recent years that we're realising again that we live in a Mediterranean climate as opposed to, um, you know, uh, a, a, a sort of a, a cold, we, we, we have, we have, we were entranced by cheap energy and in many cases uh, in recent years and recent decades have been building premises that were only really livable with uh, large, you know, large amounts of cheap energy and paid no regard to sustainability. So if we get back to Vitruvius's injunction and if our architecture is dictated by the nature of the climate, uh, we'll all be a lot better off, whether it's in your um, part of the world or mine. Yeah, 
Wow. Um, I think I'm out of my league here. Vitruvius is injunction and, uh, <laughs> and design. And neither of mine. Um, I think the only, the only observation I'll make, uh, I think it's an incredibly important set of issues. The only observation I'll make is that one of the questions, and I don't know the answer to this, but to one, one of the questions will be, to what extent does our overall urban design, uh, how, is that, how is that going to change in, in the medium term, not in the short term? in the medium term to what extent will uh will greater working from home i don't mean exclusive working from home to greater working from home actually stick um how does office design change um what happens to transport um uh, urban transport and other i mean there, you know some there's some big issues there that there will be uh, over the next 12 18 months depending on the health outcomes uh, will certainly um, have uh, like like will remain very different, uh, but what changes in the in the medium term? And that conversation, um, led by uh, people such as uh, or groups such as your Sue and the Design Council, is, is pretty important. And again, it just goes back and you know, I suspect we're running out of time, but it just goes back to this basic point, which is this is a big enough economic and lifestyle shock that it's, it, it is going to require conversations about what type of, how are we going to live? How are we going to work? Where's the economy going? Where are we going to get those right jobs that are sustainable and sustainable uh, you know, jobs that'll be there five, 10 years down the road as well? Thank you. I think we've got another question yeah, from Pelita, please go ahead. Pelita Clark from the Financial Times. And I uh, just want to thank all three of you for a terrific discussion and um, just move the conversation slightly, um, if we have time at the end, to the world's largest emitter, China, and how um, uh, any sort of green transition is likely to emerge from uh, the pan session if uh, we have a situation in as we appear to have now, where, for example, uh, in the first three weeks of March, Beijing approved more coal-fired power plants than it had during the whole of 2019. Um, very interested to hear you say, Mark, that you don't support carbon border adjustments. Um, I just wonder if you could elaborate on that, because um, a lot of economists obviously believe that this is going to be one of the few measures that is going to shift the dial in countries such as China. Um, and also, Malcolm, if you could um, say whether you could imagine Australia ever supporting carbon border taxes and whether you personally support them, I'd be interested to hear. Thank yeah. you. Okay, well, I'll, I'll start and give Malcolm the last word. Um, say a couple of things about China. Um, uh, obviously, as you say, world's largest emitter, world's largest uh, uh, population at the moment, uh, and soon to be world's largest economy. Um, also, the world's largest uh, generator of renewable um, renewable power, uh, you know, half the electric vehicles, uh, uh, and a number of the technologies um, that will be part of the, the the solution here as well. So it's as many things with, with China, almost everything in China, the you know superlatives and uh, on on both sides of uh, of the ledger. So part of the problem, but also very much part of the solution. Um, in terms of uh, in terms of, and, and they will be absolute, China will be, I mean, they're essential to anything, but they're essential to uh, the success of, uh, of, of the COP. And, uh, and of course, uh, we are very committed to the success of the, uh, uh, the biodiversity uh, COP that they are hosting, uh, will be hosting um, in the uh, not too distant future. Um, on, um, let, let, me, let me answer the last bit. Uh, just on cross-border flows uh, in two ways. Um, I, would, I would like to avoid a world where we have border adjust, uh, adjustment taxes. I wouldn't say that I'm just you know, absolutely against them. I don't think we would, I wouldn't put them in place now. Um, and it would be an unfortunate set of circumstances if we end up with big enough differences in ambition that, that they become necessary. Um, uh, and uh, so I don't think we're in that, and I don't think we're in that position now. This is my personal view, so it doesn't really matter uh, what I think. Um, on, but on the, there's another cross, cross border flow, which is around um, carbon, um, carbon offsets, nature based solutions. And one of the big missing pieces of this puzzle, 
is we have not yet, the collective we have not yet created those markets for cross-border offsets um, and uh, nature-based solutions. Um, and, but in a world where more and more of our companies, financial institutions are moving towards net zero, um, and obviously the core of their net zero is getting down their own emissions, but there is a net element, an offset element there. Um, it, the demand for these uh, markets uh, continues to grow and there's more and more uh, pressure, more and more incentive to put those in place. Uh, there's a process called the Article 6 process, as I'm sure maybe I know you know, uh, through COP, which uh, is trying to help solve this. But I think there's also going to be private market pressure and innovation around this to try to uh, address this. China is a big, big source of those offsets, of those reductions. There is a, there is a classic win-win uh, between China, rest of the world, private and public, uh, in terms of, uh, of flows of capital that get cheaper offsets, but also help reverse um, some of those trends, those short-term trends uh, that you just mentioned on the power side. Thanks. Uh, thank, thanks, <coughs> Mark and, <coughs> excuse me, Polita. The, to be brief, uh, I think carbon border adjustments are inevitable. Uh, the Europeans have made it very clear to Australia uh, publicly that uh, we should expect in the free trade agreement we've been negotiating for some time with the EU that there will be, uh, you know, a, a climate change elements in it, which uh, will design will be designed to ensure to, you know, to bluntly to pressure Australia to reduce its emissions. Uh, you know that like it's an old saw, but the, you know, a ton of CO two has the same impact on the world's uh, climate regardless of where it's emitted. So we all have an interest in everyone else's emissions. Um, so I think, it is, I think it is inevitable and I do support them as a matter of principle. Uh, obviously, you know, each country at different times will have all sorts of uh, temporal and tactical issues to grapple with. But as a matter of principle, it is a global issue. And if the European Union, for example, says uh, if countries that are importing goods and services into Europe uh, and are not reducing emissions at the rate that we, the Europeans, are, uh, why should we allow them to do that without some form of penalty and uh, some form of cost? And I, I think the President of France is very committed to this. He's been very vocal about it. I think it's, uh, I think it's inevitable. Uh, you mentioned the, the sort of switch in... Uh, well, apparent switch in policy in China, it's very concerning. Uh, very, very concerning indeed, because China is the world's biggest producer of coal. Uh, it's put a huge effort into, de you know, into reducing its greenhouse emissions and has been a driver of renewable energy. I mean, it is Chinese uh, manufacturing economies of scale, which have, have together with technology, much of it from the University of New South Wales here in Sydney, that has reduced the cost of photovoltaics. So China has a massive vested interest in, the, in green energy. Um, so it is very troubling to see them, no doubt for in, all the employment reasons we were canvassing earlier, uh, reverting to um, support for coal-fired power because that's a, that is a very, you know, that's a very unfortunate and retrograde step. Uh, just as a reminder to everyone, we are scheduled to go till half past 11, so uh, oh. we're going to be uh, take, taking more questions. I hope that's um, all right with everyone, and uh, we hope to hold your attention for longer, a little longer. So we're going to go now to Catherine. Um, good morning and good afternoon to Mr Turnbull. Um, Catherine Gray here from UK Onshore Oil and Gas. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, we've heard primarily about... A electrification and renewable, uh, but we have to consider the harder dec to decarbonize sectors too, especially as only 18% of global energy demand is in the form of electricity. Um, Mr. Turnbull, you mentioned electrifying home heating, but 84% of UK homes currently use natural gas for heating. Mm. And the cost of replacing each household's gas system with an electric heat pump runs to a cost of over £20,000. So we're talking about a nationwide cost running into the, the hundreds of billions. Uh, converting households to hydrogen seems to be the better solution here, but the most efficient and cost-effective way of producing hydrogen at present 
is reforming natural gas and capturing the CO2. This is something that the Committee on Climate Change highlighted in their Net Zero report. So I'd like to ask, would you agree with them that there is still a role for natural gas over the coming decades? Well, it's a, it's a question of economics, <clears throat> really. I mean, uh, carbon capture and storage uh, has in the, in the um, you know, coal-fired electricity generation area, I think has proved to be much more costly uh, to deploy than was originally contemplated when I was first looking at it, you know, well over a decade ago. Uh, so, uh, but uh, the taking uh, CO2 out of the much cleaner uh, stream that, um, you know, results from, you know, burning methane, which is what we're talking about here, is, uh, is no doubt more feasible. But look, it, 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 it's entirely a question of the economics. I take your point about what you say about gas heating. That's a, you know, that's a, a, a perfectly uh, valid one. Um, the hydrogen, I think the future of hydrogen, however, uh, is going to be uh, green hydrogen. Um, uh, the, the, the reason I say that is that all of the trends, and I, I, again, you know, we don't want to get, we want to be technology agnostic about this. We want to be focused on getting our emissions down and making energy affordable and reliable at the same time. Um, the reason I think green hydrogen, I think is going to be a very big player, perhaps, you know, not within five years, but certainly within 10 years, is once the uh, whole process uh, is, you know, really industrialised, um, you are going to have such an abundance at different times of the day uh, of, of very cheap electricity. I mean, the fact, you know, that the critic, the most important economic fact about renewables uh, is not the uh, long-term cost of electricity, you know, the LCOE you see written up all the time, because that's essentially a banker's calculation. The really important uh, economic fact is that it is zero marginal cost generation. The cost of generating that extra megawatt is nothing. Whereas if you are burning coal, <clears throat> is it at least, it's at least the cost of the coal or the gas. And so there are going to be times when electricity, as we're seeing in Australia now, where there is, um, you know, there is an overabundance <clears throat> and, um, and hence, you know, the opportunities for storage. But if you can use, take that, those periods of overabundance, which are driven essentially by the climate, um, the weather, if you like, uh, then, um, and, the, and you can use that to make hydrogen, obviously that's, you know, going to be a, a you know, a really um, outstanding outcome. Mind you, you'd know much better than me. Hydrogen has more, you know, is a more challenging um, gas to deal with in an industrial, let alone domestic environment than, uh, than methane. Yeah. Um, maybe I'll just supplement that, if, if I may, <clears throat> which is that uh, certainly there's a role for gas. I mean, I agree with Malcolm. We don't want to over-engineer this and uh, you know, the, the economics will drive it. But uh, I think on most scenarios, there is a, a uh, very important role for gas as a transition uh, fuel and a transition fuel measured in, uh, you know, measured in a few decades. Um, so, uh, which is why you still see um, uh, substantial uh, investment in that sector and, and, and will continue. And, you know, the return, you know, one of the things we're trying to emphasize, um, uh, and I think the market gets this, which is that it's a whole economy transition um, and so it's not necessarily a jump from where we are today to deep green, uh, you know, by the afternoon, but it's, it's a shift across a variety of sectors, including heavy emission uh, sectors to improve and, st and steady in some cases there'll be quantum leaps, but in other cases it's steady improvements and reduction um, in outright emissions, not just intensity. And gas has an important role to play, to be clear. Um, on the, um, I'll just make one point though on the hydrogen side, or two, two other points. One is on the hydrogen side, uh, look, this is a judgment, so it's not a prediction, but I, I would tend to um, gravitate towards the, um, the economics of green hydrogen as, as opposed to the other uh, uh, variants. Um, but one of the issues, and so this is an example, if I can bring it all the way back to where we started, on what's the role for government and how do we think about the restructuring of these big industries. Um, 
to the extent to which there are there is a prospect of a fuel blend, for example, in maritime transport for some hydrogen blend in fuel or potentially in aviation, um, that changes the demand dynamics for hydrogen, as you, as you would understand. Um, and it also changes the demand dynamics for the industrial processes to produce hydrogen, the electrolyzers and others. Um, and, you know, in some calculations, you don't need much of a blend, uh, for example, in maritime, uh, to, tip, uh, to have a tipping point on the, on, on the economics of, um, of the industrial processes for uh, developing it. Um, so that's an example of looking at where the economy is going, thinking about what levers governments have um, to then pull forward private innovation uh, that would, uh, would develop that. And then the last point, which is related but not directly on the hydrogen, I do think there is a question in the UK, and it's come up, it comes up every five, 10 years, I suppose. Um, but there is a question about um, you know, home energy efficiency, home retrofits, the programs that work that don't. I think we've learned some things on the nudge side and other sides of what, what can work. Uh, but to the extent to which people are spending more time in their homes, it becomes that much more important that those homes are relatively energy efficient. And that's you know, something that uh, we're gonna have to think about as, uh, as a society. Uh, next question comes from Vicky. Vicky Price from the Center for Economics and Business Research. I just want to, to understand, because we're talking about sort of market dynamics and maybe the role of government being restricted, maybe in just encouraging rather than spending a lot of money uh, necessarily. Um, uh, economists normally thought or believe, I think, uh, this, this is still the case, that uh, one of the best ways to capture the, the, the cost to climate, to the climate of um, uh, CO2 emissions would be to have a, a carbon tax. Uh, do I understand it from the discussion, or maybe I missed a little bit, um, that perhaps that isn't any longer important because other things have moved in to make, uh, you know, various bits of energy production cheaper than fossil fuels. Um, uh, but uh, can we, shall we forget about this? Uh, it, it seems to, to most of us that that would be the solution to give the right incentives to firms as well to do the right thing without needing to have their hands held and too much regulation coming with it. So I wouldn't mind a, an answer to that. So we forget about an international carbon tax. Uh, so can I start, Vicky, and maybe hand to Malcolm? The, um, I mean, you're absolutely right. It's an important tool. Um, I, I wouldn't say it's the solution, maybe if what we've learned is, um, um, you know, it's, it's pretty simple, um, you know, in the, uh, and I'm not attributing this to you, but uh, it's pretty simple in the, um, in the, in the classroom of the ivory tower say that if we just put a price on carbon, uh, we'll internalize the externality and then everything will naturally, naturally flow through. That runs into, um, and Malcolm and others, Malcolm can speak to this, that has run into political realities in terms of putting overburdening one policy instrument. Um, in other words, the carbon tax. I mean, the first best would be just actually uh, not even a carbon tax, but a, um, just an, a, a, a allocating a quantums of, of pollution, um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions through uh, quotas, and then just having an emission trading. That's first best. That's going to lead to the market-based solution gradually give it away, as, as, as I know you would understand. Second best is carbon tax, um, uh, but there's, and, and it does play a role, I think it does play a role, and it would, to, to go back to something we were talking about earlier, the, the extent to which a country or jurisdiction has a price on pollution, has a price on GHG, has a, price, a carbon tax, and has a pathway, and that pathway is credibly increasing, um, then, adjustment will get pulled forward uh, if, if, if it can be in that position. Uh, but the reason why I emphasized other factors is not to over, overburden a price on carbon. Um, there's certainly an opportunity to take the wedge that has, or some of the wedge that has happened with the, with the fall in the price of energy, uh, oil particularly, uh, at the moment. Uh, but I think you need a suite of uh, policies um, in order to uh, uh, to have these adjustments. Um, and above all, what you need is not policies that have a stop-start uh, element to them that uh, undermines, the, undermines the credibility, if that, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, just, just add very briefly, I, like Mark, I would prefer 
an emissions trading scheme to a carbon tax. I think the flexibility of a permit-based scheme, uh, as you know, had, was proposed in Australia, uh, including by the Liberal Party uh, when John Howard led it and I led it the first time, uh, was a, is, a, is a better policy um, uh, than a tax. Um, I, I'd say this, I, think, I, I don't think the need for it is as great as it was because the, you know, the cost of the new forms of generation that we want to bring through are actually now lower than, um, you know, than coal-fired generation. So the, you know, the, 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 the need to provide a subsidy is, is not there anymore. Uh, you, bait, you know, really certainty of investment is what we need, for certain investment we need. However, and I'd make this observation, Mark may want to comment on this. I mean, governments are going to be needing to look for additional revenue which is going to be very scarce because the problem with imposing new taxes, you know, higher income taxes or corporate taxes is of course the dead weight that they impose on the economy. And, you know, you, 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 governments are going to be looking for revenue, but at the same time, they want the economy to be, economy to be moving again. There is a respectable argument uh, that a carbon tax uh, would be a less of a dead weight, less of a break on uh, economic activity, say, than you know, jacking up uh, company tax uh, or you know, personal income tax. So you know, I think that's that. Um, you know, that that there may be, in other words, there may be a a stronger fiscal argument in some countries, at least, for putting a tax on carbon than uh, than there is even an environmental one, and certainly. You know, there is a strong, um, lobby is not the right word, but there is a strong group on the Republican side of politics in the United States that argues for a carbon tax uh, for essentially those reasons. Yeah. Yeah, no, Malcolm's made an important point. Um, you know, from a tax policy perspective, uh, the least distortionary, most cases, at least distortionary tax is a, is a VAT or a GST, not universally loved when they're put on, but it's... Um, but then you get into bigger distortions when you have uh, corporate tax and, and, and higher personal income tax rates. Um, and, and the carbon tax would tend to fall just inside, you know, from where the VAT is. Um, but then, uh, so, and in, a, in an environment where governments are fiscally constrained, you can see that attraction, particularly in those countries that have no price, or effectively no price on carbon. Um, and it should be very straightforward for countries that actually are subsidizing carbon, uh, as many are around the world, to, to remove those subsidies. Um, I think the experience though, uh, and this is not my field, but the experience with carbon taxes, at least as carbon taxes, as opposed to emission trading schemes, has been that uh, it is important, or in certain jurisdictions, and I'll take Canada as an example, very important to have a carbon tax where the, the, it, it's a change in the relative price, so it's an economic, or sorry, it's an environmental uh, instrument, um, and the and the proceeds are returned uh, to uh, individuals, so the relative price is changed. So in that regard, the sort of political uh, reality of um, how it's best used um, cuts against um, the fiscal, uh, the you know, potential fiscal requirement or the fiscal need. So uh, part of the reason why I didn't mention it uh, in the context of fiscal is I would think that, uh, and, and maybe I'm overly influenced by Canada, but I would think in that environment, you know, that there is an expectation that that will gradually rise, which is important for Canadian investment, um, but um, but that the proceeds would would be returned to uh, would be returned fully to Canadians, um, and so you're you're sending the signal as opposed to uh, getting the fiscal. Uh, uh, the fiscal benefit uh, from it. But Vicky, it, it comes back to where you started, which is that yes, it's an instrument, yes, it's an incentive, but I think what we're both saying is it's one of many, and some of these bigger shifts that have happened have made it a little less important than it might have been uh, a decade or so ago. Right, so uh, I think we've got one very quick last question, and if uh, the question could be brief and the answers very brief as well, then uh, we will uh, we'll make that the last one. So, John, please go ahead. Robert, um, House of Lords, 
Um, can I, uh, uh, I'm uh, struggling to make my question brief, but I will try. Um, I support the broad direction of travel that both speakers uh, have set out. The one caveat I have is about storage. Um, because when I've looked at the economics of storage, um, and obviously they're going to come down over time, but battery technology, uh, uh, hydro, carbon capture, are all at the minute quite challenging. Neither speaker has mentioned yeah. uh, nuclear, so I'd be interested to know how they think that fits into the picture. Hmm. Well, just very quickly, it's a uh, nuclear is. Uh, is nuclear power is very expensive, as you've, you're finding out in the UK. Uh, there's a lot, always a lot of talk, some of it romantic, about these new modular reactors that are going to, you know, um, sort of be the Tupperware equivalent of uh, nuclear <laughs> power stations that will make it all much cheaper. Uh, no, people talk romantically about them. There isn't one in existence. Uh, I honest, honestly, I, I, I don't have a problem with nuclear power you know, and any, I'm not against it from any particular point of principle, but I honestly, I think the, uh, in Australia at least, uh, I think the race is run is won by renewables plus storage. Um, uh, you're right, John, that the cost of storage is coming down, particularly batteries and uh, pumped hydro is, is act, can actually be very cheap, but it entirely depends on the site. You know, there's so much of the, the cost, there's very little in the way of operating cost uh, other than, you know, the price you pay for the electricity to pump the water up the hill, which you're obviously going to pay very little for that. So it's all about the civil works and that depends on the site. So you can't, it's hard to generalise. Uh, but, you know, with nuclear, nuclear power is not a, uh, I don't think there are, there would, I don't think there's an economic case in Australia for nuclear power for uh, uh, electricity generation. I mean, I do canvas this point in my book. It, that's you know, re, you know, reasonable length. I think the argument for some civil nuclear industry in Australia would be to enable us to have a nuclear navy. That's the that is the uh, or elements of a nuclear navy. That would be the the best argument for it. But gee, it's a as the Australians here uh, would know, that would be a political battle that would take a long time and consume many leaders of both parties, I would think, were it to be undertaken with any, uh, you know, uh, vigour. So it's a, that, that would be a way off. Yeah. Um, if I could just, uh, last minute, um, when I think about it, uh, we've, we've talked a lot about conventional uh, renewables, which, which are just economics. So from a financial perspective, that's mainstream uh, finance. And then as you walk out from that, you move towards storage, hydrogen, um, and ultimately carbon capture uh, and storage and use. And uh, the last of those is out in the VC end of the spectrum. Um, whereas uh, both on battery and hydrogen, you can see pathways to them becoming economic. They're not economic now, but understanding the relative economics there, both from a public policy, but very important from a private sector perspective, is where people are looking for the opportunities. Some breakthrough on carbon capture and use um, is important for this. Um, and if you look at where, I know, uh, John, I don't, I don't mean to avoid your question. I'm, I'm agreeing with Malcolm by implicitly, but I just wanted to draw attention to the fact that part of thinking about the energy transition and the transition to net zero is it highlights the choke points, which you can look at if you lack imagination, I guess, as an impediment or if you see entrepreneurial opportunity, you see where the opportunity is to invest because it opens up whole new industries. And I think batteries and storage are close to that tipping. Hydrogen is a huge opportunity that actually there could be public uh, policy interventions that shift things. Carbon capture, storage and use. Um, there are some interesting technologies, but, but they're still far from uh, economic. Um, and so you actually have to see some breakthroughs on the technology side, which is, to my way of thinking, more a venture capital question as opposed to a public policy question at this stage. Great. Well, uh, thank you very much, Mark and Malcolm, and thank you to all you guys for watching. We'll see you at the next webinar. Bye. That's thank great. You very much. Thank you very much, Julia. Thank you, Malcolm. Cheers. Thanks. Pleasure.